when it comes to choosing a watercolour palette, there really are so many options and you don't really have to rush out and buy one unless you want to because you're sure to be able to find something around the house that'll do. Um, you could have an old dinner plate, uh, a paper plate, um, you could even use the lid of an old ice cream tub after obviously eating all the ice cream and washing out the lid because all you really need is something that can take a little bit of water because this sort of palette would be used for squeezing the paint fresh from the tubes uh, every time you paint. You can also buy uh, inexpensive little plastic molded palettes, either something like this, which is quite cute, or you see those big flat ones with uh, some of them have got wells and some of them have got rectangular spaces. Those are great too. You can also get uh, palette paper and that's just got these sort of plastic sheets that you can tear off when you're done with and throw them away. So plenty of options, even uh, a scrap of watercolour paper would actually do because all you're wanting to do is have some sort of area where you can check the consistency of your paint, add a little bit of water uh, and do a bit of colour mixing. And when I first started in watercolour, these were the sort of palettes that I gravitated to because I had heard that you got the best results when you used paint that was fresh from the, freshly squeezed from the tube. Now I'm happy to report that I don't believe there is any truth in that whatsoever. I'm a complete colour addict and I've never been disappointed with the colour that I get when I use paint that has been previously dried in my palette. And I think that if you use this style of palette, it's great, cheap and convenient, but I do feel that you're missing out on one of the most wonderful properties of watercolour and that's how convenient it is. Because I actually, apart from watercolour, I love working in oils. They're thick and buttery and glorious. But I paint with them so infrequently because it's a right palaver to actually set up the palette before you paint, squeeze out all the paint from the tubes. Uh, and invariably you do that in the wrong amounts. You put out too little, so now you have to interrupt the flow of your painting and rush off and find the right tube and squeeze out more, or you squeeze out too much and then you feel terribly guilty, extravagant and wasteful. So all of that can be completely avoided if you choose a palette that comes with a lid, because then you can store the any paint, um, it's always ready to go, all you've got to do is give it a quick spritz with water and you're fresh to start the next time. Now when it comes to lidded palettes, this is the first one that I was encouraged to buy when I went to an in-person uh, watercolour class at a community centre. It was about the only useful thing I got out of that. That class almost put me off watercolour entirely, but that's a different story. Now this is rather nice because it's sturdy, it's got a lid, uh, and it's got these very generous wells. You know, that is quite a delightful sight, isn't it? So you've got plenty of mixing area. You can also use the lid. And these big wells take at least a whole tube of paint at a time. And there's an advantage to that. I like these big brushes. I love a loose style of painting. So these are the kind of brushes that I use the most. And when you put those into this well, you can see that well is actually big enough to take the whole thing which is pretty good because when you're using a tiny well you can end up damaging your brush as you touch the sides of the little wells repeatedly with this brush but i have to say even though there is such a spirit of abundance about this great big palette i haven't taken this out for oh a good five years because it's a bit too unwieldy so as nice as that big generous size is, it does mean it's harder to store. You need that much more storage space and you need that much more space to work in. I mean, this has kind of filled up my whole desk already and I haven't even got the paper, the water and the brushes out yet. So I think choosing a palette with a lid is a good idea. And then being mindful of the size because really very often our, um, Painting practice can be more intention than actually getting on and painting. And a lot of it is to do with how easy or difficult it is to get started. So I think these practical considerations are actually pretty important to start your uh, painting off in a kind of joyful and easy way. 
let's put that one aside and look at some smaller options. You can get pre-filled um, palettes, tiny little ones like this, for example, and they're always rather nice. They have possibly have this little extra tray which gives you more mixing space. You can extend it like so. Lots of different colors, really fun to use tiny little wells but you know that's the trade-off for the smaller more convenient size and it's wonderful to have a, a variety of colors in there and a great way to get started because choice can be so overwhelming but you might want a little bit more control over the colors that you've got available to you in your palette so another option is to buy a palette that is empty and you can fill it with your own colors. You can buy plastic ones that fold up in various sizes, and those are great. Um, and most of those, because they come, they're made of molded plastic, those little wells are fixed, so you can't move them around at all. Once your color's in there, it's gonna stay in there. These ones, this is my favorite palette at the moment, and this is a metal palette, and it's got these little tiny plastic pans inside. Now this size is called a full pan and this size is called a half pan and you can buy these empty and you can buy them filled and you can buy them half filled, half empty. That's how I got this one. And these are great because you can uh, add as you go along. When I first bought this, it only had these two rows filled and these are all empty and I've gradually added those over the years as I found new colors that I wanted to experiment and play with. And these little pans can actually uh, pop out of their little trays and you can move them around. So that's quite handy because um, when you set up your palette, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, I'll show you that, uh, you know, that it's quite nice to have them in a, in a sensible order, but if you're adding to them as you go along, you might get a bit upset that they start being out of order, which is one of the limitations you've got with those fixed wells. The other thing that's worth mentioning, um, and I'm not the sort of person who's got the patience to do these big color swatching uh, sheets. I see lots of artists do that and I know there are some people who find that very relaxing and enjoyable and that's fantastic because it's actually quite a helpful exercise with your palette. You might notice that uh, these colors here dry in the palette all look very much the same. So it's a great idea to create some sort of little diagram. Now you can obviously draw out a perfectly to scale kind of realistic version of your drawing of your palette and then write in with a waterproof pen the color that's in there and then do a little swatch of the color so that you can see what the color is like um, on the paper compared to in the dry in the palette because you can see those look quite different like these I could never tell apart if I didn't have my little chart so those are great to do, whether it's just on little scraps of paper that fit in your palette or whether you're going to do make a whole creative project out of it and create a, a lovely, um, carefully drawn out diagram of your palette. Recently, one of my lovely subscribers wrote in to tell me that she just bought a new palette for her watercolours, which had 18 wells. So I imagine it looked something like this. 18 wells round the outside, and then in the lid, it would have had some mixing spaces. And she'd also bought what we call a double primary set of watercolour paints. All that means is that she had six paints and she had to put them into these 18 wells and she was asking for some advice on how to go about doing that. So it is quite nice to have them in some sort of order and the colour wheel is as good a way as any to go. So I suggested putting the reds, yellows and blues evenly spaced around the palette so that she had some room to expand because there's a good chance that you're going to want to collect some additional colours so you kind of want to leave some room for those to fit in and I've called them convenience colours. I'm talking about the secondary colours that you can mix by combining for example the reds and the yellows will make oranges and this is why you often get this double primary because with the warm and cool variations of each of the primaries you should be able to mix an awful lot of colours. 
but there are so many wonderful colors available these days that you probably will want to buy some of these uh, convenient and exciting pre-mixed colors. So let's say you got some pinks and some oranges, they would go in this red section, add in a couple of greens perhaps, and of course my favorites, the purple. And as you go along, you'll be filling up these spaces. And this is where it becomes quite convenient if you're one of the kind of people that like things in a perfect rainbow order, you might be a little bit unhappy with these fixed mixing wells and you might want to consider the ones that you can move around. But I have to be honest, you very quickly get used to which paint colours are in which spots in your palette. So even though I can move those um, little pans around in my palette, I really don't tend to. So I wouldn't be overly worried about it and I would advise trying to just let go of being too strict about these things because it's an imperfect system, you're never going to get it right. If you really like painting things like florals, for example, so you might collect a whole range of pinks and reds uh, and then find that you have to pop a few of those reds uh, into the kind of blue-green area, for example. So, you know, those kind of things might happen, you've just got to kind of roll with it. Uh, one of the other things you might end up doing is getting a colour that is more of a neutral, something like a brown. And in this system, we haven't really got a space for those, although if it's a warm, ready orange brown like a burnt sienna, I would pop it up here with the reds and yellows. A cooler brown I'd obviously put with the purpley blues. Um, there's always a plan that you can make. But if you know that you're going to collect a lot of neutrals, one of the other things to do would be to move everything over a bit, leave less space in between so that you've got extra room at the end for your neutrals. So perhaps you could pop in your brown, your burnt sienna and your paint gray at the end. So it's nice to have some sort of idea, some kind of structure to start out with, but as I say, um, you'll very quickly get used to it. So try and let go of being too perfect in your palette because that's going to make you feel tight and uncomfortable painting and there's no point in starting painting if you feel like that.